This talk is on the division of labor and social order. And we'll begin with, uh, with a quote, a great uh, quote from uh, Ludwig von Mises. Um, there's so many great uh, quotes in Ludwig von Mises, uh, Human Action. And this is one of the, uh, one of the top uh, uh, quotes. Uh, I, I, that's just my own uh, uh, preference for, for this particular quote. And the reason why, I'll just give you a little background. I, I was trained actually as a neoclassical economist and didn't know anything about um, the Austrians until I'd finished my, or almost nothing, until I finished my PhD work. <clears throat> and it was only after that, a couple years after that, I was reading through uh, Man, Economy, and State, and Human Action, and the classic works. And, you know, every, almost everything you read in, in, in these works is, uh, I should say, uh, augments far beyond uh, the knowledge that you gain in a neoclassical program. And it, it's almost to the point of boggling my mind when I read uh, things like this, where Misa says, human society is an intellectual and spiritual phenomenon. It's the outcome of a purposeful utilization of a universal law determining cosmic becoming, namely the higher productivity of the division of labor. As with every instance of action, the recognition of the laws of nature is put into the service of man's effort to improve his conditions. You know, all economists, uh, all students of economics learn about the about the division of labor and about comparative advantage and so on. And we're going to talk about some of that, uh, the nuts and bolts of that uh, uh, this afternoon. But not every economist conceives of the, uh, the uh, meaning of the division of labor in this way, right? It's, it's just a magnificent statement of, uh, uh, of the uh, knowledge that uh, economics can unlock for us, that we can perceive the, the true nature of human society that it isn't uh, merely uh, uh, like the call of the blood. Right? It isn't, it isn't uh, a Fuhrer who, who you know, organizes all of us as pawns in some master plan. Uh, but it is, as, as Mises says, it, it's, it's the recognition that all of us have of the laws of nature as we put them to use in our actions, right, to improve our conditions. Uh, what Joe Salerno called uh, economizing. We're just, we're just striving to economize our actions. And we perceive that uh, uh, in interacting with other people, we can do this through a division of labor. Now, I'll make uh, one more uh, uh, preface to, uh, to uh, the discussion, the, the nuts and bolts discussion of this. <laughs> and that is that uh, economics as a discipline, as an intellectual discipline, some of you may know, was uh, born with this insight. It was this insight that led to the uh, development of economics as an academic discipline. <clears throat> it was the scholastic writers who uh, conceived of society as what we might call a natural order, that there were natural laws that God had put in place that were working themselves out in society. And society could be left alone by the by the state, right? We could, we could work this out ourselves precisely because it's a manifestation of human nature where we're all just trying to do what God has designed us to do. That's how the scholastics thought about this, right? We're just trying to economize. We're striving to better our condition or we're striving to attain uh, ends that we value more highly in uh, ways that uh, economize on uh, the resources that we have. And well, we can do this more uh, fully if we uh, integrate our actions. <clears throat> now, let's uh, turn then to the, to the nuts and bolts of this. Um, let's start with just a working definition of the division of labor. The division of labor fundamentally is just uh, the uh, opposite of self-sufficiency. If you're not su self-sufficient, if, in other words, if some of your production is to satisfy the consumptive ends of other people, then you're in a division of labor. So, so, so these are polar opposites. And again, it doesn't take too much imagination for a person to recognize that uh, uh, his or her standards of living, material well-being, is astronomically higher in a division of labor than it is in self-sufficiency. Uh, uh, Joe Salerno mentioned the Amish uh, as an illustration of people who live in a rather simple way. And uh, so I, I'm in Pennsylvania is where I live, and there are a lot of Amish. We have Amish communities around the Grove City. Uh, but they, they don't live in total self-sufficiency. Yeah, they live in kind of low standards of living in a material sense relative to us, but they still have a division. Some of them are farmers, some are cobblers, some put up houses, right? They're still engaged in at least a rudimentary division of labor. 
<laughs> so now we can ask the question, well, why would that be so? Why would people choose then to come out? What is the principle by which they see that it's to their advantage to come out of self-sufficiency and enter into the division of labor? You know, it's one thing to sort of look at the wonders of modern production and you know, and, and to realize that in self-sufficiency we wouldn't be very well off. But it, it's a little bit different to see why that's so, right? What exactly is it that drives all of the uh, development of the division of labor? And here we just have to recognize the uh, principle that the natural world is diverse in its productivity. That human beings are diverse in their productivity. We're not, we're not the ant heap. Right? We're not interchangeable cogs that can simply be in interchanged in different production processes and leave production the same. If you take uh, Tim Cook and uh, take him out and make him a carpenter and take Frank Weintraub, a local carpenter at Grove City, and uh, put him as the head of, uh, uh, of Apple, you won't get the same result in either production process. <clears throat> the same is true, by the way, of all, f all uh, resources. Right? Land sites are this way. They're not equally productive in every endeavor. You know, uh, uh, eastern Nebraska is really good for growing corn, but it makes a lousy seaport. You know, <laughs> they haven't figured that out yet. I suppose, I mean, there's an underground sea, but <laughs> they haven't made use of that yet, I guess. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, so, th so we, we find that as well, right? There's this uh, uh, diversity of the uh, productive uh, capacity of different persons, different temperaments, different personalities, different skills, different upbringing, and so on and so forth, so forth that create this. And because of this, then, there can be differences in the efficiency of different combinations of these resources in different production. And that's what we recognize, right? That, that we can do something, you know, I could, I could try to make my own automobile from scratch in self-sufficiency, and the cost would be that I, I couldn't do anything else because I would have to devote myself fully to that endeavor uh, and all my working uh, uh, effort. Uh, uh, or I can have, uh, I can have uh, Honda, the Honda Corporation do it. I can have those guys over there do it, those 1,000 guys or 10,000 or how many employees they have. They can do it. And when Honda wants uh, tires produced, they, they do the same thing, right? They say, hey, look, we could do that ourselves. We could set up a little tire production operation, or we could just buy the tires from Michelin, which is cheaper, right? Which is more efficient for us. So, so that's the kind of uh, uh, underlying uh, principle that's behind the uh, development of the division of labor. Now, uh, it, this is the classic uh, pedagogy <laughs> when discussing uh, the division of labor. We resort to very uh, simple, stylistic kinds of illustrations just to uh, see the, uh, the fundamental uh, principles at stake because they're easier to deal with than, than complicated, complex situations. So we're going to go to uh, Robinson Crusoe, and uh, Crusoe has come into contact with Friday, and so we can have the possibility of a division of labor. But just for a moment for the setup, let's think about Crusoe's uh, production schedule here. So what I've uh, put up the chart is a production schedule. C is uh, the gathering of coconuts, and B is the picking of berries. <clears throat> And you'll notice something peculiar about this, or if you study economics, it looks quite normal, but maybe uh, peculiar to non-economists. Um, as you move down the chart, the, the quantity produced by, e by the application of each additional unit of labor, let's say hour of labor, is diminishing. So Dr. Salerno again talked about uh, uh, marginal utility, the principle of diminishing marginal utility, and Dr. Holtzman. Uh, now we need to talk about the principle of uh, uh, the law of returns or diminishing uh, marginal physical product. <clears throat> so the MPP sub L is the marginal physical product of labor. It's the additional output that Caruso gets by applying one more unit of its labor, let's say an hour of labor. Now, why does it diminish? So in other words, uh, if he applies just one unit of labor, one uh, hour of labor, let's say, to coconut gathering, he gets six coconuts. But if he then applies another unit, he, he only gets five for the second unit. If he applies the third, he only gets uh, four, and so on. He, he applies his first unit to uh, berry picking, he gets two quarts of berries. But once he's done that, when he applies his labor again, he just gets one and a half quarts. And once he's done that, once he applies his labor again, he just gets one quart. Now, why does that happen? And, and the reason this happens, as we mentioned before, is that uh, natural resources are diverse. If natural resources are diverse, then they're gonna be more productive coconut gathering areas and less productive. They're going to be berry bushes that are more uh, lush and easier to pick. 
uh, and so on. They're going to be coconut grows close to his uh, cave, and coconut grows far away, where he has transportation costs to get the coconuts far away. So naturally, if he's economizing, what, what he's interested in doing is producing, he'll apply his first unit of labor to the most productive complementary factor of production. The, the coconut, he, he'll pick up coconuts on the ground nearby. But once he's done that, he can't, that's exhausted, right? And now he has to move on to less productive. And, and so we get the law of returns. <clears throat> and uh, again, economists would insist that this law, like the law of diminishing marginal utility, is universal. It applies to all production processes. So again, to switch to a real case, <clears throat> let's say we look at world demand for corn and we want to bring certain land areas in the world into corn growing. Well, we'd start in, as I suggested already, in eastern Nebraska, because that's where the corn huskers live. <laughs> These are the jokes. <laughs> okay, no, no, just kidding. But uh, okay, so but but what if world demand exhausts that, exhausts the capacity of eastern Nebraska corn growers? Well, then you're going to move corn growing to the next most uh, productive, relatively most productive area, right, and so on. So uh, corn can even be grown sometimes in, uh, still in western Pennsylvania, which, which hasn't really been a corn growing area. Uh, Pennsylvania is a dairy state, agriculturally speaking, it, but it hasn't been a corn growing area for hundreds of years. But if, if the corn prices are right, you know, the farmers will plant. So, so that's the idea, right? We get these diminishing, we apply our productive effort to the most productive complementary factors first and then sequentially to the less. Okay, so now with that set up, we, we can see Friday, uh, compared to Caruso, is less productive in, uh, in uh, what we call an absolute sense, or as I've put the word on the slide, proficiency. Uh, Caruso is more proficient at both gathering coconuts and uh, picking berries uh, compared to Friday. Now, again, there, there, are very, there could be various reasons for this, and we're not going to go into uh, all the details of this. We just point out, look, people are different. People are different, they live in different areas, that have different productive capacities and so on. And so when they apply their labor to producing, you get differences. And they, and, and they would look something like this, right? Now I will say though, in passing, that there is, uh, what I put on the uh, PowerPoint slide here is the difficult case. We could imagine an easy case. Uh, again, let me switch back to uh, corn growing. We could imagine the case where we ask the question, should farmers grow in Nebraska, should they be self-sufficient in corn and oranges? And uh, the farmers in Florida, likewise, self-sufficient in corn and oranges? And if not, how should they specialize? And it's quite obvious that they should specialize um, in Nebraska in corn and Florida in oranges. But that's just because we know right away, without any examination, uh, that uh, you know oranges are uh, it's quite a fertile growing area in Florida, and it's a real good uh, corn growing area in Nebraska. That each one is proficient in a different thing. But here we have the hard case where Caruso is more proficient in both things. So what do we do about that? Okay, can can uh, Caruso enter into a division of labor with Friday when Friday is a weaker producer of everything? So, so that's the case we've, we've posed. Now that's where we get to the principle of efficiency. <clears throat> um, efficiency tells us the cost of production, and we can calculate it in, uh, in units of the good here, right? Uh, we can calculate what the cost of production is, and we'll do a calculation in a minute. <clears throat> but basically, efficiency is found by the trade-off ratio as Caruso or Friday moves from producing coconuts to berries or vice versa. If they switch back and forth to producing one or the other, they produce more coconuts than they produce less berries. We can determine how many berries they give up uh, to produce a coconut. So we can calculate their cost of production, their opportunity cost. Okay, so let's go on to do that. And again, we'll make an assumption about their preferences so that we have a, a firm uh, numeric example. Let's say that Caruso and Friday both choose to allocate just three units of their labor to these two production processes, and they allocate their labor in the same way. Uh, each one of them allocates one unit of labor to coconut gathering and two to berry picking. So their preferences are roughly the same. Their, you know, the ordering of their preferences is roughly the same. The pattern of it is roughly the same. Now, of course, we could have differences in efficiency and trade and the division of labor just on the basis of our preferences being different. That, that, that happens in the real world too, right? 
So I, I hear that the French really like to drink wine. And, and, you know, they grow really great wine, but they're such gluttons for wine that they, they want to consume even more than just the French production, maybe, right? So wine could be grown in Spain or in California, and they could drink that wine too. And, 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 right? So we, we might be uh, efficient in California, even though we're not sort of in the abstract or technical sense, uh, efficient in uh, wine growing as the French. But anyway, I just, I'm leaving aside all those uh, nuances, uh, just taking this, again, uh, 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 straightforward case, right? Okay, so if they allocate, remember again, if they allocate, we'll get these totals. Uh, uh, Crusoe will pick six berries, uh, excuse me, gather uh, six coconuts, and then he'll, he'll pick uh, two quarts, and then he'll use his third unit of later to pick another one and a half, so he gets six coconuts and three and a half quarts of berries. And then Friday... It's five coconuts and one quart of berries. So that's where these numbers come from. Six coconuts, three and a half quarts of berries, five coconuts, one quart of berries. That gives the two of them 11 coconuts and four and a half quarts of berries. So that's their uh, produ uh, you know, group production, if you will. You notice, though, that uh, the opportunity cost of production is wildly different between the two at that production uh, pattern. Again, to go back to the slide we're here and here so notice if uh, Caruso wants to produce more berries he has to give up six coconuts and he can get one quart so his cost for producing one more quart of berries is six coconuts Friday on the other hand gives up five uh, coconuts and his additional production is only one fourth of a quart of berries so his cost is 20 coconuts per quart of berries if we standardize the cost right <clears throat> So it's clear that Friday is a, a much higher cost producer of berries. He's inefficient, high cost producer of berries. So we should switch the production in the division of labor. We should switch it from self-sufficiency, having Caruso produce the berries and Friday the coconuts. So let's try that and see what happens. We switch Caruso to his three units of labor now goes to uh, only berry picking. He'll get two for the first, one and a half for the second, one for the third, so he gets four and a half quarts of berries. And Friday allocates his three units of labor to uh, coconut gathering. He gets five for the first, four for the second, three for the third, so he gets 12. So now the group gets 12 coconuts and four and a half quarts of berries. So they've raised their physical productivity. That's the basic story of the division of labor, right? That, that's the logic of the division of labor. We have two producers, they differ in their efficiencies, they specialize in their area of efficiency, and with given inputs, output goes up. Right, so this is, this is just logically what happens. This is a, uh, we've now logically demonstrated this uh, principle, right? This is what Mises is talking about when he talks about the greater uh, productivity of the division of, well, that's part of what he's talking about, in the greater productivity of the division of labor. Okay, now well, let's ask one more question, though, like my uh, example of the uh, corn growing areas. You know, we, we, we saw there kind of vaguely that if world demand is really large, we'd have more areas of <clears throat> reduced efficiency brought into corn growing uh, than if uh, world demand was pretty small and, uh, let's say, Nebraska, eastern Nebraska farmers could satisfy world demand with their own production. Then, then we wouldn't need to bring any additional producers in. So we can ask the same question in Caruso and Friday uh, circumstance. We can ask the question, when will their specialization stop? How far will they specialize? Now, in, in my example, I've constructed the numbers to m coincide uh, with their inability to specialize any further with the actual efficient point of stopping their specialization. That, of course, wouldn't always be the case. <clears throat> but anyway, we can calculate, once we get to this point on their um, allocation of labor from the chart, we can <clears throat> calculate, recalculate the opportunity cost for producing more berries, and we'll see at that point that it's equal. Again, let me pop back. Uh, Caruso now is right here, allocating all three of his units of labor to berry picking. If he wants to switch to coconuts, he'd have to give up that, that unit of berries to get six coconuts. So his cost of producing that unit of berries is six coconuts, as we saw before. Uh, Friday's right here. He's producing three coconuts. He's giving up half a quart of berries. If he switches, he'll, he'll get three quart, uh, coconuts, get a half a quart of berries. That's six coconuts per quart of berries. So their efficiency at the margin is exactly the same. 
<laughs> again, the realistic e example would be if corn growing goes all the way to Western Pennsylvania, then the efficiency of production in Western Pennsylvania would be the same at the margin as the efficiency of the last corn growing area brought in uh, to production in Europe or wherever else, you know, whether uh, other parts of the world uh, corn is grown. Now, again, we can't go into all the details of this. It raises all sorts of interesting economic puzzles. But let me just, uh, this is kind of a quiz question. If, if eastern Nebraska farmers are really efficient, if their costs are low, and uh, western Pennsylvania farmers are inefficient and their costs are really high, and yet they're both in the market together selling a product at the same price, <laughs> how can this persist? <clears throat> and the answer for the advanced students already know this, but uh, so I'll give away the answer to the uh, beginners. Uh, the answer is land prices are bid up in in Nebraska. Investors want to get in on that extra profit, right? And they bid up the assets that can be used to get this greater productivity. They bid up those prices. So that the the actual costs, if you include the the cost of your assets, is the same across all producers. You get capital gain, but not extra profit from that extra efficiency. Uh, okay, so that, that again is our basic, uh, basic uh, demonstration. So we can summarize now this first uh, step um, for the talk about the division of labor. So the division of labor, we, we see uh, increases uh, productivity. We specialize factors according to efficiency. Then this must be the result. There can be there are no counter cases to this. It, if we have differences of efficiency, then we specialize according to that efficiency. We'll get more output per, uh, well, for our given inputs, whatever they happen to be. Now, second, in order to, in order for people to share and then, and therefore to willingly consent to this division of labor, uh, they must, there must be mutual benefit. And this mutual benefit doesn't come from just producing and having the extra output. It comes from exchanging the output at mutually agreeable rates, right? So the division of labor and trade always go together in the natural order. We, we're not going to do, you know, uh, we have a big accounting program at Grove City. And we graduate, I don't know, 30 or so accountants every year. And they go to work for a big eight accounting firm. And all they do is the books for some, right? They're just doing books and asset valuations for some business. Now, if they couldn't trade those services, would they specialize in that way? Uh, no, of course not. They can't live this way in self-sufficiency. They can't live this way just doing books, right? No, they have to trade. Trade is the way in which the greater uh, productivity is obtained by mutual consent of the, of the uh, participants in the division of labor. And so they go hand in hand. Uh, we'll, we'll mention the implication of this in a minute. So in my example, I just have Caruso trading one uh, quart of his berries for six and a half coconuts and Friday trading six and a half of his coconuts for one quart of Caruso's berries. And they both wind up with half a coconut more than they had in self-sufficiency. And that's why they do it. Right? Or, or at least that's a sufficient reason to explain why they do it. And then uh, the last point here we want to make on, on uh, this summary uh, chart is that specialization per se doesn't have anything to do with this argument. It's not specialization per se that does anything. Uh, if all the land in Nebraska were specialized in oranges and all the land in Florida was specialized in corn, we'd actually get less output than self-sufficiency. So there's no magic in specialization per se. It has to be specialization according to efficiency. <clears throat> uh, this is what a lot of our uh, friends in the broader social sciences don't quite comprehend. They chide economists for, you know, you just want people to specialize. You just wanted to be little rabbits on the assembly line or whatever. And that was, that was kind of a strange metaphor. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but that's, not, that's not at all what we're saying, right? What we're, say, what we're saying is that when there are differences of efficiency, specialization will generate this productive gain. Now, in the cases where specialization doesn't do this, specialization, for example, could, like on our, our assembly line personnel, uh, our assembly line personnel, maybe they get uh, bored on the assembly line during the day. Well, that's an entrepreneurial problem then, right? That's a problem for the entrepreneur to manage his workforce, to make sure, you know, he's doing something to uh, stimulate their interest, or, or, he's, or he's getting rid of those workers and he's hiring other 
workers who are actually able to do the repetitive tasks without without injury or uh, inefficiency. So, so this is just an entrepreneurial issue. It may also be the case, of course, that specialization improves productivity. That could, that could happen too. A person could do something over and over again and get better at it. That can happen. But that's not really what we're talking about. That, again, is just a practical question that, that's managed by people as they see empirically what's happening uh, with their different production processes. It's just an entrepreneurial problem. <clears throat> okay, so... The last thing we want to mention uh, uh, in this uh, Caruso example is the law of association. Uh, so you might be wondering, or at least uh, students in principles of classes at this point are wondering, what about poor Friday, though? I mean, couldn't, couldn't we find, you know, Friday works out okay with Caruso, maybe just because we have two people, but w what about people who really don't produce very much of anything and, you know, don't they get sort of shut out of all this? It, 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 can you show logically that there's a room for them in the division of labor as well? Or is it just, you know, because, well, okay, we've got Crusoe on Friday, we just have two people on the island, you know. We, but what if we have a million people or uh, seven billion people and they have these different productivities and we have really low productivity people? Then uh, c c is it possible logically to show that there's room for them in the division of labor? Yes, there is. This is called the law of association uh, that demonstrates this. Now, there is a caveat, there is a principle uh, in the law of association that we'll talk about. There's a caveat we'll mention at the end. But just to go through the logic, the logic looks like this, again, for Caruso and Friday. This is all we need to show the logic of the case. <clears throat> if, we, if we calculate the opportunity cost of producing berries, as we've done already, Caruso trades off coconuts for berries at 6 to 1. So he's efficient relative to Friday because Friday has to sacrifice 20 coconuts per quart of berries. And so that's why we had Caruso specialize in uh, berry picking. But the opportunity cost of producing uh, berries is in terms of coconuts, and therefore we can also calculate the opportunity cost of uh, producing coconuts in terms of berries. And the opportunity costs of these two different, uh, producing these two different goods are just reciprocals of one another. So if uh, Caruso trades off six coconuts for one quart of berries, he has, to, he has to trade off one quart of berries for six coconuts. He trades off one six uh, uh, of a quart of berries per coconut. <clears throat> but Friday only trades off one twentieth of a quart of berries for a coconut. And so he is the more efficient producer of coconuts. R remember, what makes him the efficient producer of coconuts is that he can produce almost no berries. And so when he produces coconuts, he doesn't give up much, right? He doesn't give up hardly anything. This is why Tim Cook won't push Frank Weintraub out of his carpentry work. Because Tim Cook has a huge opportunity cost to be a carpenter. Even if he's really good at carpentry work, he's not going to take Frank Weintraub's job. That, that just won't happen. <clears throat> so yes, even the low productivity persons, even if their proficiency is low, they're efficient somewhere. This is, again, just a mathematical principle, right? It's a law of reciprocals. We have two numbers, one bigger than the other. If we take the reciprocals, the, the inequality sign reverses. So, yeah, this must be so. Okay, now uh, let's go on to talk uh, the rest of the time about the limits to the division of labor. The division of labor, again, is a central a principle, both of society and of uh, economic uh, analysis of society. So it behooves us to think about the... Uh, the uh, limits to the division of labor. Now, uh, the first one that I've listed here, the uh, extent of the market, was noticed by Adam Smith. So we already went over this argument, right? If I can't trade with someone, if I'm barred somehow from trading with people, then I'm going to have to be self-sufficient. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be an accountant for my whole career if I can't trade my accounting services for, for uh, food and shelter and clothing and so on, right? That uh, I'm going to have to give up uh, specialization. <clears throat> so anything that bars the uh, trading, anything that would interfere, uh, unnatural interference with trading, would then actually uh, make us less physically productive because it would, it would force us toward uh, self-sufficiency. So I, I doubt if, uh, if the Donald is watching the live stream, but that, that's our answer to, uh, to uh, his economic uh, trade policy. <laughs> um, so government intervention then, uh, obviously, in all its forms, uh, interfering with trade will actually make us more self-sufficient and therefore less productive. It will, it will uh, suppress 
uh, this drive we have toward uh, the uh, extension of the division of labor. <clears throat> and then the other limitation uh, that I uh, uh, want to uh, make a few comments about is the extent of saving and investing. <clears throat> this is something uh, Joe Salerno mentioned in his first talk, that there's a capital structure in, uh, uh, in the economy. So we mine iron and produce steel and stamp the steel and defenders and then make cars. So there's, there's this vast uh, capital structure in society. And that capital structure is built up through saving and investing. And this capital structure, of course, is what provides uh, opportunities for millions and hundreds of millions of people to, uh, to uh, specialize in an area where they're efficient. It's the development of this you know, increasingly sophisticated set of uh, interwoven production processes that provides room for all of us in the division of labor. Again, we can imagine the case, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of an imaginary construct, uh, uh, but we can imagine quite easily what would happen uh, to our standards of living in the division of labor that we all enjoy if uh, tomorrow when we woke up, uh, you know, the capital structure of the economy had, had, had just been blown to smithereens. If we had no capital whatsoever, we'd all resort just to, uh, you know, hunting and gathering and primitive farming and, and so on. And most of us would, would die. So, so if, we, if, we run the, if we run that uh, thought experiment the reverse way, we can see that that pretty well describes history. Right? So we start with these sort of, sort of primitive production processes. The human population isn't very big. <laughs> you know, it, uh, if a pestilence comes and a lot of it dies off, you know, the big swath of the human population dies off and then, you know, rebuilds. And there, there's a sort of limitation to how far things can go, right, uh, without, without saving and investing, without the Industrial Revolution, uh, to put it in historical terms. But once we get that, it seems like, uh, no, the sky's the limit then. It seems like the, 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 this... It doesn't seem like there's any particular technological limitation um, ex except the, the one caveat that I uh, do want to mention. <clears throat> now, this one caveat uh, that Mises mentions in developing the law of association, remember this is the idea, right? We Every person can find a place in the division of labor no matter how extensive it becomes. The one caveat is that the human population must not take up the entire surface area of the planet in productive activity. Or if we colonize other planets, the surface area of those planets. As long as we are not at that point, then we can extend the division of labor and the human population can increase. And not only increase, but increase at higher standards of living. Okay, so thankfully we haven't reached that point and, uh, and this, uh, this uh, process uh, can go, uh, go on uh, uh, as far as we can tell, indefinitely. <laughs> uh, okay, so now let's think about uh, overcoming these limitations. How do, we, how do we proceed to overcome the limitations? Well, of course, the main thing is to eliminate all government intervention in, uh, in a trade. Uh, the state can intervene in all sorts of ways that uh, force people uh, uh, not to trade, to prevent them from trading. This means, of course, that there are efficiency differences that they can't take advantage of. So we're left with inefficient production. We're left with, uh, you know, too much auto production in the U.S., let's say, if they're protectionist tariffs on imports or, uh, uh, you know, other uh, cases. Uh, if, if the French uh, protect their wine industry, then, uh, then there's, there, there are these uh, efficiency differences that we can't exploit under pain of, uh, uh, of the state. Uh, the same thing happens when the state subsidizes uh, activity, though. They can, they can forcibly uh, make people trade or use the power of coercion to uh, create uh, artificial differences in value that uh, people will then uh, follow in trade. Uh, like, uh, let's say, uh, well, it's been in the news, let's say NASA. Okay, so I, they spend, I don't know, how many billions of dollars to uh, put their little probe, uh, send it out to Pluto and... Ten years later, we get some pictures and some data. And, uh, well, okay, you know, that if this is an economizing uh, activity, uh, one that adds to the division of labor so that we should have these scientists doing this and we should invest in the propulsion systems and the, the gizmos that gather the data and so on and so forth, uh, then we have to have a market to indicate this, right? If, we just, if the government can just extract tax funds from us, and then uh, spend them lavishly on, you know, as they wish, 
on the project, then all we, all we, we lose all uh, ability to engage in this process of economizing uh, our resources. We're just being forced, in other words, to get something of value that has less value than what we've given up, the set of goods we've given up. So the government is uh, uh, doing this uh, constantly. And uh, we, so if we can eliminate, or to the extent that we can eliminate this activity, we would, we would unleash a greater degree of the division of labor. We also want to eliminate state decision-making over resources. Um, again, uh, Tim Cook, we want th this kind of entrepreneurial uh, decision-making of uh, uh, Tim Cook and other great entrepreneurs who are producing these products and suffering the losses when they do poorly, right? They're decapitalized and the capital funding goes to others who are doing better, uh, as opposed to bureaucrats. So we don't want the state, right? We should remove, in other words, decision-making from state bureaucrats. We should get rid of public education and uh, uh, you know, public transport and so on and so forth, all these uh, uh, areas of resource use, uh, road building and what have you, where the government is, uh, government bureaucrats are simply sitting again, uh, spending uh, funds that they've coerced from uh, the taxpayers on projects without regard to uh, the economizing nature of this. Sure, this creates jobs, but as the Law of Association indicates, we don't need jobs, we've got plenty of jobs. We, we, we need efficient jobs, right? And the government forces us to uh, replace efficient jobs with inefficient jobs, and this is not a net gain for uh, the social order. So this process is underway. And then uh, I've also, uh, just uh, noted here that this, the process of the market is a self-selection process, right? Where we're self-selecting into these different occupations by mutual consent of the, of the people that we're uh, interacting with. So uh, the, the, we have entrepreneurs and they wanna hire whatever it might be, say mechanical engineers to design things. And then there are people who are trained to do this task and uh, they get together, they have a job opening and uh, they get together and they hire this particular group of people uh, because they find that uh, the terms are mutually agreeable, right? So there's a self-selection. So I wouldn't be hired as a mechanical engineer. And, and uh, even if I wanted to be, uh, uh, that was my dream. That would not, I wouldn't be self-selected into this. No entrepreneur would seek me out uh, to do this job. <clears throat> so there is this, there, again, this is a better than, what I'm saying is it's better than having a, like a closed process of the state where jobs are assigned by political procedures or what have you. We want to eliminate that sort of thing and have an open self-selection process like we have on the market. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, on this uh, point, uh, I put this uh, idea of the uh, natural barriers. What about the natural barriers? So again, uh, when I learned economics as a neoclassical economist, uh, uh, most of my neoclassical colleagues would go along pretty much with what we've done. You know, they recognize the division of labor and comparative advantage and all that stuff and how the state can interfere with this. So they wouldn't be really against, uh, in principle at least, the things that I've pointed out. But oftentimes they get down to this last point and, and, they, and they do uh, have a sharp disagreement. By, by natural barriers, what I have in mind are things like uh, culture. I, I hate to keep bringing up the Amish, but uh, but the Amish, you know, should we should we should we should we propagandize the Amish constantly to try to get them to be hip like the rest of us and like you know higher material standards of living? I mean, what's wrong with these people? Should we you know is that the is that a necessary uh, 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 part of the process of developing the division of labor that they're they're being laggards and. You know, they're not really doing their part for society and so on. And, and you know, surprisingly, there are models uh, by the neoclassical economists that would say, yes, yes, they are. Yes, they should, should sort of be dragooned into the normal, you know, uh, process of the rest of us, uh, even though they have these cultural, uh, you know, reasons and religious re reasons, or, or maybe it's just uh, preferences that some people have for doing things differently uh, that don't don't kind of, integrate well into the norm. So we're not saying that, right? We're, we're not saying that we, uh, Austrians would not say that we have to uh, dragoon everybody into the division of labor in some fashion, but simply that people are again self-selecting. They're free to come in and out the division of labor as, uh, as it's mutually advantageous for them to do. 
and then and then also I'll, I'll mention just uh, quickly the objective what a, so culture and preferences and so on we might call subjective uh, 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 natural barriers then there are objective natural barriers and again my neoclassical friends are are eager to get rid of these uh, I'm thinking of things like transportation costs or transaction costs you know those are evil things that have to be gotten rid of you know it's it's terrible that the, the government maybe can lower tran, uh, transportation costs for ocean going vessels or whatever so we can get our cars cheaper from overseas or whatever the particular case might be but again the Austrians would say no 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 that's not, <laughs> you know if they're if they're kind of uh, natural obstacles to the division of labor that's just part of the world as it is right that's just that's just uh, uh, something we have to deal with in the world. Again, there might be people who aren't so bright. Uh, there might be, you know, mountains that we have to go go over, and uh, so on to deliver things and what have you. Well, these these are just features of the world that uh, we grapple with, and not things to be, so to speak, uh, uh, done away with, or not special problems, if you will, uh, to be done away with. <clears throat> and then finally, on my uh, last slide, let me uh, conclude by. Uh, uh, just outlining real briefly the the process of saving and investing in capital accumulation. <clears throat> uh, again, you'll hear more about this in in uh, talks uh, later uh, this week, and many of you have uh, uh, already been exposed to this, right? But uh, uh, economists like to lay out the logical structure of capital accumulation, uh, this process of saving and investing, and uh, building up the capital structure so that we have more and more um, tailored uh, occupations for more and more people, uh, producing at higher and higher standards of living, you know, the progress that we've seen since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, anyway, it depends uh, in part upon our preferences, our what we call in economics our time preferences. Uh, the extent to which we save and invest is determined by our uh, preference for present satisfaction relative to future satisfaction. So if we don't have a uh, really strong urge for present gratification, if we're willing to uh, 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 put off present uh, satisfactions for greater future satisfactions, uh, then people like that will save and invest more. You've probably seen the statistics on the Chinese. Uh, while Americans save maybe 5% of uh, their incomes, the Chinese save, well, the figures vary, but it's a, you know maybe up to 50% of their incomes. And so we wonder why their economy grows at 8% or 10% per year, and ours grows at 1% or 2%. Uh, that's part of the reason, not the complete answer, but this is part of the reason. So, so there's more saving and investing, the building up of this capital structure. And for our purposes in the division of labor, again, uh, the point that we want to see about the capital structure is the, the capital structure develops further and further uh, nuances of productive activity for people to engage in. And, and, and therefore to find their niche in, in, the, in the social order, right? To find a place in the social order. You know, the famous illustration of this is uh, exactly how much music would Mozart have composed had he lived in 1000 AD in uh, Asia. You know, if, he, if, he, if he's spending 16 hours a day grubbing in the field or hunting game in the forest or whatever, like everybody else, right? Everybody's doing this. Okay, so we lose that. That's the point. We, we gain that only by developing the division of labor, which develops not, not only higher standards of living so that Mozart can have what we might call leisure, but that, that he can actually be productive and earn income in uh, composing or performing or you know, things that couldn't have been done uh, by people, at least uh, except for, again, the political class who had tax money who could hire people like this, but it couldn't be done in the natural society for, for thousands of years. Uh, uh, this is also the place, the building up the capital structure is also the place where new technology uh, gets integrated into production, again, raising our productivity and providing new uh, opportunities for people of diverse interests and abilities to find their uh, place in the division of labor. And uh, then this generates our, uh, our uh, higher uh, and uh, growing uh, standards of living. Okay, at this point, uh, we've used our 45 minutes, so I'll stop here. Thank you.